Good morning everyone. Welcome to another very exciting day on looking at the basic conditions that our, our body requires to heal itself. And I, I love many things in the Bible. And we looked at one yesterday and it's 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16 where God says what, what a union has the uh, temple of God with idols. And what agreement. And ye are the temple of the living God. That's an incredible thought, isn't it? Yeah. And thus saith God, I will dwell in you. I will walk in you. You will be my people. And, and I, you know, I think it's the first, I will be your God and you will be my people. Mm. It's an incredible thought. We're also very familiar with the other verse in the Bible in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, 16 and 17. Know you not that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And we also looked at when, when God said in Exodus 15:26 where he says, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and do that which is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, then I will put none of these diseases upon you that I put upon the Egyptians. <coughs> so it's not that God struck them down with that. It's just their lifestyle caused that effect. They defiled their bodies and as a result, the diseases come and archaeologists and scientists who've tested the remains of the Egyptians find that they had cancer and arthritis, very similar diseases that are happening today, which are really lifestyle diseases, which is exactly what the Bible says. But let's go over to 1 Corinthians 6, um, and it's chapter 9, uh, verse 19, chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. And I'm always intrigued with the first word, what? In other words, exclamation mark? Do I really have to go over this again? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. We, are, we know we are not our own because we were created. But notice what it says, you were bought with a price. In Desire of Ages, the author states that Christ was sent on a very expensive errand when he came to planet Earth. And in uh, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1.18, the Bible tells us what the price was. It says, for you, you were not bought with corruptible things as silver and gold, passed down by the vain conversations of your father, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church that has that sanctuary message. And yet every Bible <laughs> shows that, that the sanctuary in the, in the desert, and it's a beautiful illustration of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You were bought with a price. So we are God's by creation and by redemption. And notice what the next part of the verse says. Therefore, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I was brought up in the Presbyterian church, and there is no mention of health message there. No, no mention at all. So when at the age of 25, I became interested in the Seventh-day Adventist church and I became interested because they had a health message and I was a hippie, vegetarian, and they, they were and I'd never heard of this. And so when I began to study the Bible, wow, the health message just jumped out at me, something I had never seen when I was in the Presbyterian church. And yet... These verses show very clearly, know you not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You are not your own. So, so we have no right not to treat this body well. And 
When, when we look at Isaiah 58, we looked at that briefly the other day where it says, uh, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. And we looked at how that really is a direct quote to the health message, isn't it? Absolutely. Because who's in chains today? <laughs> the smoker, the, the alcoholic. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And we know the Bible talks about the word of God as the breath, the breath of life. And we also talked about how when you bring relief to their physical ailments, they're, they're open. They're so much more open. When people come to our health retreat with headaches, we just praise God. Because do you know what that allows us to do? Give them a hot foot bath massage their shoulders and bring them relief and oh I, we, we even had two people having hot foot baths and massage the shoulders to bring relief to their headache and one of the guests came in and said I think I'll get a headache <laughs> <laughs> it just soft, softens softens the people down Notice what the next verse says in uh, Isaiah 58. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. Do you know what this means, uh, medical missionaries? When you start doing this, your health will spring forth speedily. If you have your windows open at night and your bedding's fresh and natural and clean. If you have sunshine every day and in our last lecture this morning we're going to look at what temperance means. It really means not taking anything into the body that will harm it and a lot of concentration is put on that. What about the next bit? Not overdoing. So don't take anything into the body will, that will harm it and take in moderation the good things. So you can't sit there after three platefuls of food and complain about the alcoholic. Mm. <laughs> Taking in moderation the good things. Early, early nights. <laughs> That's what we're going to be talking about today. What is the effect of sleep? And what effect does it have the body when you don't sleep? Almost to the point of drunkenness. Do you know that there are more accidents because of people falling asleep at the wheel than to alcohol. So you can't point the finger at the alcoholic if you're going to bed at midnight. Hmm? Eating well. We're going to be looking at that. Making sure you're well hydrated. Surrendering your whole heart to God. Allowing him to dwell in you, walk in you. So we have to get the temple, the temple of the living God, in place. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee and the glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. Then shall thou cry and the Lord will answer. Thou shalt call and he will say, here I am. If thou put away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger. See that? You've probably heard this. When you point the finger, how many are pointing back at you? <laughs> that's a very important part of it it's like the lady that that came and I said how much water do you have a day she said oh, I have quite a bit in my cups of tea <laughs> by the end of the week she was drinking four glasses of water a day and the student might come and say excuse me Barbara she's supposed to be having eight <laughs> Wow, four, four's a lot in a week from a lady who drank none. Mm -hmm. And remember God's number one character trait is mercy, mm. mercy, mercy. So we, we, want, to, we want to win them. We don't, we don't want them to, um, to move away. We want to bring them in because what's our aim? Our aim is to hasten the soon coming of our Lord and Saviour, isn't it? That great, that great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's what we, want, what we want to hasten on. And he, he's delaying his coming. Why? Because he doesn't want any to be lost. So even though our health retreat is a business, and it must be a business, because if it's not a business, 
it won't pay for itself and then you're going to have to close down. But we know it's a mission. <laughs> and when I say to the guests, every morning we pray for you by name. We pray that God will give us wisdom as to what to do. Oh, every heart is melted by that. And this, this young lady who was only 30 was at the retreat recently, and I've mentioned her a few times, who was a Muslim. She didn't want to hear the name of Jesus in the first few days. Well, by the end of the week, we were praying in the name of Jesus, and she was smiling. Amen. <laughs> oh, you know, you just see little by little. And remember, I cannot... I cannot convert anyone. I cannot convict anyone. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And he will bring them at the pace that they can cope with. So that's, they're the agencies that we must work with. I don't think there's ever been a time on planet Earth where insomnia has been so great. And the Russians knew that if they kept a man awake for 16 days, he would die. It's one of the most effective forms of torture is not to let someone sleep. And I was reading about a man, oh, this is probably 50 years ago, who was, who was in a communist country and he was in prison and they were keeping him awake. They kept jolting him. They kept hitting him. And he, he had to walk from one room to the next and he looked at the reflection in the glass his legs were the size of his torso. His eyes were bulging out of his head. He'd been awake for something like 10 days. And that's, whew. and yet how many people do that to themselves? The only hope of better things is the education of people in right principles. Isn't that true? The right prin Let the physicians teach the people that restorative power lies not in drugs, but in nature. It's in nature. So let's pull right out from the middle, rest. And what we're going to look at is what the science is showing us today. So in the base of our brain, there's a tiny little gland called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland releases four hormones every night. So these hormones are released only in a five-hour period. So in the winter hours, it will be, be between 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. And in the summer hours, it'll be between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. Light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control center in the brain where your body clock is located and the body clock communicates with the pineal gland. Now I know it's a little bit difficult here in Sweden because I don't know whether I've ever seen darkness here. <laughs> Does it ever get dark here? <laughs> I've... Oh, in the winter, but not in the summer. I get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and look out the window and it looks like dusk and it's midnight. So I'm very glad and thankful for a, a heavy curtain across my window <laughs> because the first night I would wake up at four, whoa, daytime, four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I found that I could go to sleep if I, if I made the darkness come. <coughs> but still, the body adapts to the environment where you are. And because of the light and dark signals, the the stage of the moon, the tides, these messages are going through into the brain causing a release of four hormones in that five hour period. One hormone is serotonin and serotonin is your mood hormone. So if you want to feel good, go to bed early. And how many people that suffer from depression, anxiety are going to bed late? And I think anyone that's had children, I think we all are familiar with children if we haven't had children ourselves. What are they like if they go to bed late? Oh, the next day they're not themselves. <laughs> they're, 
<laughs> they're a little bit difficult. They didn't get all their serotonin levels. And I think the children know if the parents didn't get all their serotonin levels because they get jumped on for every little mishap. <laughs> the other hormone is epithalamin. Epithalamin increases learning capacity. And if you talk to the teacher, they can tell the children that had late night. If you haven't got your epithalamin levels, it's difficult to uh, totally comprehend the information. It's difficult to retain the information. So as students, it's vital that we go to bed early to get our epithalamin levels. And epithalamin also slows down aging. They've done studies on this and they've looked at um, uh, musicians. Musicians, especially rock stars who, who would a average going to bed at 2 a.m. every morning and they deteriorate very, very quickly. From a distance, they might still look slim and the dye on their hair means that, you know, it's, but look too close and you'll see the heavily lined. <laughs> they age very quickly. Number three, the other hormone that's released in these hours is arginine vasotocin. Arginine vasotocin is our natural painkiller. Did you know you have a natural painkiller? Your natural painkiller is arginine vasotocin. But when we use our arginine vasotocin, which our body naturally will do if we're in any sort of pain, there's a waste that's given off. And if that waste is still around the next night, then you won't get your full quota of arginine vasotocin. So how do we get rid of the waste through the day from using arginine vasotocin? Where is it? Exercise. <laughs> when you exercise in the day, you perspire and the perspiration releases the, argon, the waste from the arginine vasotocin. I have a girlfriend who, and of course back in the 70s, nurses didn't have the equipment to lift patients like they do today. So it was very common for nurses to get bad backs. <laughs> But today they have lifting machines, they even have orderlies that are designed, you know, men. And actually, men are designed to lift heavier weights than women. It doesn't mean women don't lift, but women have wombs. <laughs> and if they don't lift correctly, they can weaken their womb to the point of prolapse. And remember what we looked at? How do you lift? You lift with the biggest muscle mass and the biggest bones in your body and the way to access that is to <clears throat> engage the core and keep that back straight. And so when you exercise through the day, you release the arginine vasotocin. And my girlfriend found this. She had a very bad back from nursing. They'd done an operation on her, but it still wasn't really good. And she was on painkillers. And she was 38. Now, what does that mean? When you're looking ahead and tomorrow, I'm going to show you the part of the brain where we look ahead. And she thought, where am I going to be in a year? Where am I going to be in 10 years? And she was concerned about her pain killing medication because it wasn't doing what it used to do which meant she had, had to do more. And then she got to the point where she was addicted to the pain-killing medication. And then she saw in the newspaper an ad for a meetings that were being done in the town, how to relieve pain. So she went and it was an exercise specialist and he was telling about or discussing the arginine vasotocin. And so he talked about exercise 
And he said, when you exercise, you cause a release of the waste from using arginine vasotocin. And so to access your arginine vasotocin, yes, you have to go to bed early, but you have to exercise the next day so that you're releasing the waste. And another thing happens when you exercise. If you have any injury in your spine, your muscles, your ligaments, your tendons can be built up to compensate. What an amazing body we have. And so my girlfriend started walking five kilometers a day. She said often in the first kilometer, she could feel the pain, but she kept going because it wasn't too bad. And then as she walked and her body loosened up, it got easier and easier. And she experienced less pain, so she started to ease off her medication. Because when there is an addiction, there must be a very slow weaning off. Very slow weaning off. And I think it took her about six months. She was off all her medication and she was managing her pain. That's an incredible story, isn't it? Because she found that as her, as her muscles and her ligaments and her tendons build up, they seem to come in and support the, the weakness that had happened in her, in her back. And she started accessing her natural painkiller. I've met quite a few people who've been able to do it that way. In fact, in Australia, um, narcotics dependency is big. It's quite big. It's a real problem now. And so, would you believe it, on the nightly news one night, they had a man, he was quite fit, he looked like he was 50. He said, yes, I was addicted to the narcotics. And he said, I didn't like what was happening or where I was going. So he said, I went to an exercise physiologist, a personal trainer, and I started exercising. And he said, and I was able to ease off. This is on the nightly news. Hardly ever do you see something like that on the nightly news. And, and he also talked about he started drinking more water and he stopped the stimulants. Praise God when this is coming from the nightly news. But he said, I'm off all my medication. He said, I actually feel very good and I'm managing my pain. And then they had a girl on who was quite overweight. She looked about 30 and they interviewed her. And they said to her, what do you think of this? She said, I'm in pain and it's my right to take as many painkillers as I want. So <laughs> it was such a contrast. <laughs> such, a, such a contrast. But there's your arginine vasotocin. We're going to be looking at pain in a little bit more detail um, this afternoon. But that is something to remember. An important point. Arginine vasotocin is not only your natural painkiller, but it puts you into a deep sleep. So the earlier you go to sleep, the more likely you are to fall into a deep sleep. And number four is melatonin. Melatonin is called your fix and rejuvenate nighttime hormone. So what if someone does go to bed at midnight? They're only going to get a half dose of their serotonin, their epithalamin, their arginine vasotocin, and their melatonin. <coughs> So the million dollar question now is what boosts that and what inhibits that? So we're going to have a look at how you can increase the output of your nightly hormones. So how can you increase the output? Uh, early nights, that's common sense. Now I think we can all appreciate you've actually got a plan sleep or the, your plan the time you go to bed, you've got to start working towards it about an hour before you actually go to bed. Yeah. Isn't that true? I know when I'm minding my little grandchildren, Sophia and Lennox, they're four and six, their mother likes them in bed by 6.30. And the only way I can do is I start at five. Because <laughs> they have a light tea, they have a little bit of fruit, they, and then they have the bath, and then there's the story. And I notice what my, my um, daughter-in-law does. She has the, you know, they have a light tea. And of course, do you remember what we looked at, what helps um, release melatonin? Bananas. That's a great evening meal, if you do have an evening meal. So she, she gives them a light tea. 
and then bath and then they go straight from the bath into their bedroom where they get dressed and the story's there, the blinds are pulled and, and you get quite a nice uh, easing into bed. And that's what I noticed. You've got to start at 5 to get them into bed at 6.30. And so there has to be a little bit of a planning. And because it's the light and dark signals, it's important, and we're probably referring more to your winter now, is to have the lights low at night. Now, the lights that really confuse the issue, yes, they are, are the fluorescent lights. So we're going to make a list of what can decrease the output of these hormones. Absolutely. The, um, so we're just going to say bright night light. light. Oh, I'm a poet and I don't know it. I'm making rhyme all the time. <laughs> So bright night light. <laughs> now the moonlight doesn't interfere with it. So if a little night light is needed, of course it's a dull, it's a dull soft light. So bright night light interferes with it. And do you remember one of my initial statements? Light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control center in the brain. Now living in Sweden in the summer, yeah, there's hardly any dark, but I would endeavour to say that your pineal gland and your eyes and your body adjust to that because that's what you're having every night, but keeping the dark. The other thing is when your eyes are closed, you don't know what's out there. Is that right? My son, Peter, when he was about, oh, it must have been about 12, he said, Mum, I've got a really good remedy on how to get to sleep. I said, what's that, Pete? He said, stare at your eyelids. <laughs> I said, I'll remember that, Pete. Sounds like a good one. <laughs> this is another thing. This is a very good point to bring this one in. Laughter. Yes. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. Do you remember where that proverb is? Yes. Proverbs 17, 22. And remember the life of the flesh is in the blood is Leviticus 17, 11. So I love the way as you memorize, you'll start to see little patterns and uh, it can make it easier to remember things. Yeah, laughter. We should be laughing more. Mm -hmm. Children laugh 125 times a day. We should laugh more. My, my little granddaughter was looking out the window. She was 10 at the time and she was laughing. And I w went to the window. I had a look. I didn't quite know what she was laughing at. I said, what are you laughing at? <laughs> she said, look at Pa's truck. He's, he's got a shovel stuck on the back of it. She thought that was terribly funny. <laughs> Made me laugh too. <laughs> Do you remember what Jesus said? Unless you become like a little child. You know, it's that, that natural confidence. It's also the abiding trust. And it's also the, the simplicity, the simplicity of a little child. So laughter can increase the output of the hormones at night. Now, you're probably not surprised to to show me or to see me write the next one, screens. That's one of the biggest inhibitors of good sleep. And when we looked at sunshine yesterday, remember the sunshine, we get blue light through our melanopsin receptor site on the eyeball and the screens have blue light. Now this is particularly up close one. So there's your iPad, your computer, your iPhone. And we have got a huge problem with addictions today on not only children, but teenagers and even adults addicted to games. In fact, I was talking to a man who has a, he's got like a farm down in uh, the bottom of Australia. It's called Del Hunty Park and they get young people coming with addictions and they take them out into the bush and they camp and they, you know, they canoe on the, on the river. And he said, we're dealing with a, the most severe addiction we have ever dealt with. He said, this is even more difficult to conquer than the addiction to ice, methamphetamines or even heroin. He said, it's the addiction to technology. 
So the, the games, but also the uh, Facebook. One lady said to me that uh, the people in the flat above her, like an apartment, she said this little two-year-old was always crying, always crying. And she just thought, what's going on up there? So she decided one day to come up and just see was everything all right. And she went to the door and the screen was open and she looked in and there was a little one crying, pulling at her mother, and there's her mother mm. on technology, mm. on technology. So my friend um, turned around and walked away. That, that was the answer. This, this, this little one <laughs> could not get her mother's attention. And uh, what else have they got but crying? <laughs> So the screens. Now, I just love my WhatsApp. I can talk to my family every day. But be very cautious on your exposure to it. Very cautious what you do with it. But these are things that you will come across in, uh, in the health retreats, is people who are addicted to technology. I find that most people who are addicted te to technology don't come. <laughs> It's difficult to uh, help someone if they don't see their need. And you've heard the old saying, a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. They, they have, to, have, to, have to want to. But at our retreat, we always turn the technology off every night. I think 8 o'clock, we turn our Wi-Fi off. And we, we let everyone know that we're turning the Wi-Fi off. But we live way out in the country. I know that there are some places where it can't be turned off. But to encourage everyone, and of course you start with yourself, is to um, have your technology out of your bedroom or in the far corner. So I charge my technology either through the day or in the bathroom, just, just in another room. And that's what you can say to our guests. Um, if you've only got one small room and you need to charge, there's, you know, out here. Yeah? Do you believe it's an issue even if it's like on what we call flight mode? Yeah, flight, flight mode certainly stops the frequencies searching, which of course is what the problem was. And I'm, I think I mentioned yesterday that the figures are that 80% of Americans sleep with their phones, so under their pillows. Mm -hmm. So these definitely, exposure to these, decrease the output of those hormones at night. Sunshine in the day. Sunshine in the day gives those really nice clear signals and sleeping in the dark. What my daughter always had in her children's bedroom was a uh, Himalayan lamp, a Himalayan salt lamp. Have you seen those? It's like this huge lump of Himalayan salt with a, with a light in there. And that, that's a very nice soft night light. And that's giving off uh, negative ions. Remember we looked at the negative ions, the electrically charged oxygen molecules. So how could that give off negative ions? Don't you need movement and moisture and air? Well, the air's there. And there's definitely the moisture in the magnesiums in the salts. But you've also got the, the, the frequency of the lamp. It's causing enough movement to give off, um, to give off uh, negative ions. So they can help purify the air in a small way. Stress certainly decreases the output of the hormones at night. And the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, yeah? You've got to deal with it there. Let's, and isn't it true, when we lay down to go to sleep, then, then our mind starts to work. It's called the chat room. <laughs> chat, 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 chat. And this is what my mind does. Right, I'm going to do that, and I, I'll start a garden there, and I'll do, 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 do. You've got to get out of that chat room. Now, if... If it's the sort of chat room that someone has been unkind to you or someone has been very mean to you, uh, I know recently I got an email that was very challenging to me. It was from one of my daughter-in-laws and for some reason she thinks that I don't bath the children every day and she thinks that I'm putting them to bed too late and wow, I'm thinking where did all this come from? <laughs> and my husband said, Barbara, don't answer it. 
She was very, very angry for some reason. D don't answer it. But you know, I'm a, I don't know, it's part of my brain. I want solutions. I want to fix the problem. So you know what I did? I did write her an email, but I never sent it. <laughs> and the Bible says, let your speech be always with grace. But I just need to present my case. But you can't always present your case. You can't always present your case. And you know what I thought in my mind? I think God's working on her <laughs> because she's an atheist. I think God's working on her. And what really irritated her was the children come back from being with me a week and they start, start to talk about Jesus. You know what my little granddaughter said? She said, Nana, I've always heard the stories of Jesus, but now I love him. Oh, how beautiful is that? Oh, it brought joy to my heart, but it would not bring joy to my daughter-in-law's heart. Maybe she said something like that. I don't know. And then I see all the little poetry books that, that you know, about Jesus. They've all been sent back to me. Oh, that is hard. So what can you do? So what I did was I wrote an email to her. It was a very nice email. The Bible said, let your speech be always with grace, but it's just in my drafts. I showed Michael. I said, what do you think? He said, no. He said, Barbara, just let it go. Time will heal. You're going to be away for six months. Just, just, just let it settle down. Because he said, you are an amazing grandmother. And he said, you always bath the you So it's, it's not grounded, you know, but I guess it's in us to want to want to defend. And I have to tell you that that was harder to take than being banned from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Wow. So what are you going to do with that? Because I lay down to bed at night and I'm thinking, but I bath them every day. But I, that was a... So I got up and I wrote the email. And you know that it was all now in that email, in my drafts. Don't press send. <laughs> so I wrote it in the drafts, so it just stays in the drafts. And it might stay there forever. But it's been written, so it's in the mind. You've got to deal with it in here. And then I could go to sleep. So, you've, and so what I usually do in the chat room, and this is, you know, when I went to Scotland, I woke up in the morning, ah, daytime, ah, four o'clock. <laughs> so yes, pull the curtains. So to get out of the chat room, there's many things that you can do to get out of the chat room. Yes. And I read it in a book, the chat room, and I thought that is perfect description of the chat room. We all know the chat room. I can see by your smiling and your nodding heads, you all know the chat room. Mm -hmm. Now it's very hard to hold me down. I love work. I love doing things. And of course, it always is going to happen here before you do it. So I'm organising it and chatting away in my mind, but I need two more hours sleep. So after the break, I'm gonna, we're going to go into time like that. So I, I start to go through my memory verses. I've memorised probably the longest section was James chapter 1. It's 27 verses. So I start to go through that. And in the morning, I wake up and think, I think I got to it. Verse 13. <laughs> <laughs> Just something to get you out of the chat room. Now, a lady recently told me this, and I thought it was an excellent idea. She said, you know what I do? I lie there, and I think about my great aunt. And I think about when I was a child, and she had the most beautiful garden. And I think about her Persian cat. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you, and, and then you might pick someone else. And you know what's really good for me? It's really good for me to choose my daughter-in-law and all the things I love about her. Because mm -hmm. there's lots of lovely things about her. <laughs> um, and you might choose a neighbour or you might choose a, a girlfriend that you lose you knew long ago. You might choose someone that has since died. You know, my father died two years ago at the 92. And I might think about my father. He was a pilot. And when I was 16, dad was learning to fly. And we, we kids could take turns in going into the plane. And we'd go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. My husband said, oh, they'd never allow that today. <laughs> 
But you see what I'm saying? You, you take your mind out of the chat room. Another great way to get out of the chat room is do the principles that's found in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks. And make a list of all the things that you're thankful for. I am so glad I'm in a comfortable bed. Thank you, Father, I'm not in a Siberian work, ca work camp with newspaper over me. Do you know the best books to read when you've got a 40-hour flight of life in a Siberian work camp? <laughs> and then you'll realise you're in luxury <laughs> and you will not complain about the 40-hour flight. There was a, there's a book called It's the Long Walk and it's about these three people who escaped from a Siberian work camp and they walked, took them one year to get to China. Yeah. Oh, and at some stage they're going through the desert. I thought a person couldn't live more than three days without water. They were five days and they eventually found mud and they sucked on the mud. Wow, you read stories like that, you value what you have. Yeah. You value what you have. So lay there and be thankful. It's like one man here. And, and this is what I found is that some people who can't sleep, and you will come across this, I can't sleep. This is ridiculous. I've got to sleep. Why can't I sleep? I've got a big day tomorrow. That person will never sleep. Do you sleep if you're getting annoyed with the fact that you can't sleep? So we're actually going to also say getting annoyed. This is ridiculous. I should be asleep. I need my sleep. So I come get an email from a lady. I'm still not sleeping. I'm not sleeping. I, I'm tired in the day. You know, how can I ever heal without sleep? And she goes on and on. I've done everything. So I wrote back and I said, there's one thing you haven't done. I told her about three emails ago to, to thank God that she can't sleep. Oh, she got very annoyed at that. <laughs> So I thought of something else to say. I said, you haven't thanked. You haven't been thankful for the sleep you get. <laughs> anyway, she, ha she hasn't written back to me. <laughs> when I can sleep, I, I stop getting annoyed because I rest anyway. So yeah. it, it helps me a lot. That's right. If you can't sleep, be thankful from the fact that you can just lie down mm -hmm. and have a rest. Yes? Only, I, I say to me, slap air, relax. I try relax. to relax as much as possible. Relaxing as much as possible. And I know we were taught this method when I was in one of the pregnancy classes I went to. They said, lie down at night and start at the tips of your toes and, uh, and, and um, cramp the, the, the tips of your toes and relax them. And then you go through the whole body mm. where you tighten. That's the better word, tighten. Tighten the thigh, relax the tie. Come up, tighten the abdomen, relax the... And you go through the whole body. And by the time you've gone through the whole body, your, your body is, is relaxed. So, uh, being in the chat room, being in the chat room, you'll never sleep. Being in the chat room. And everyone you talk about, they will immediately know what you're talking about. <laughs> and whether that's when you first lie down or whether that's when you wake up too early or wake up in the middle of the night, um, being in the chat room will, will uh, keep you out of sleep. Large meal at night. We should be eating breakfast like a king. We ate like a king this morning, didn't we? Lunch like a queen. And do you know sometimes the queen eats as much as the king? <laughs> and tea like a pauper. One lady said, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. <laughs> but you said, uh, as a prince uh, for lunch, but you know, princes, they're younger, they can eat them a lot. That's right. <laughs> now, the old saying is, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen. And maybe the, maybe the princes are eating with the king in the morning because they're the next king. 
But most people today, I know in Australia, and I see it in many places I go, it's breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and then king and the queen together at night. <laughs> Isn't that true? When we lay down to sleep, our whole body wants to sleep. But if you've got food in your stomach, your body can't sleep. Your stomach can't sleep because it must digest that meal because in that warm environment, the food can begin to rot and you could be poisoned by the fumes. That's, that's termaine poisoning. You've heard of termaine poisoning, sort of an old term, P-T. O-M-A-N-E. That's from food rotting in the stomach and the fumes coming off it. So the large meal at night. And when people have a large meal at night, are they interested in breakfast? Not at all. Not at all. Now, there might be still remnants of breakfast in there in the morning because, the, because when the sun goes down, all body functions slow down. In fact, your insulin... Um, responsiveness is most active in the morning whereas it's least at night. So we have many diabetics come and do our program and we give them breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and that's it. And what are they told most of the time to do? Eat every two hours. Yeah. Now if they feel they need something at night, we usually give them a protein drink because a banana is not a good food for a diabetic because it's very high in the glycemic index, which means it gets the blood sugar level up really high. Great for the kids, great for people. <laughs> if they need something at night and they don't have a... The, another, another great food at night, which doesn't increase the melatonin, but it digests very quickly and it certainly can stop the hunger pans and is perfect for a diabetic, is an avocado. That's got a nice sly, slow rise. But if someone needs something at night and they're a diabetic or in the middle of the night because their blood sugar level goes too low, that is a clear indication that they're on too much insulin. Because insulin will just bring the blood sugar levels down whether you need it or not. So we always get the people with diabetes because they've got to handle it themselves when they go home. They do their blood sugar levels, they, they monitor it and they're the best ones to do it. And what we find within 48 hours, and we'll be talking about this on Sunday, I think we talk about food, that we find that di diabetics are having to reduce their medication within 48 hours, They're having to get, start to, to get it down. But if someone's at all concerned, they say, what if I need something in the night? We make them a protein drink and we give them one, say, at 7.30 at night and we give them another one to have by their bed if they feel that they, they might need something in the night. So, and I, I did mention the protein powder we use is a pea one, basically coming from legumes. Or you can get quite night hemp ones, or brown rice ones, or organic soy ones. I know in Australia the health food shops have quite a variety of uh, protein powders that are plant-based just got to make sure there's no sugar or flavorings in them. Yeah? I've read that uh, the amount of bile uh, is at its, uh, it's high in the morning, but it's even yeah. higher at noon, and it's all down to almost nothing uh, yes. after six. <laughs> That's that right. Th that is correct. And of course, your bile is what digests your fats. When we go through the journey through the gut, gut you will see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? When should be the last uh, meal? When should be the last meal? Do you know it depends? Mm -hmm. It depends on many things. Um, most people do well to leave, you know, three or four hours before they go to sleep if they're going to have an evening meal. And I say to parents with children at school and teenagers at school, you know, husbands out working, I say, Make a hearty breakfast. <laughs> Have more fibre, protein and fat in the breakfast. And most children don't eat much lunch at school. Have you noticed that? They just want to play with their friends. So they actually could just have an orange or an apple at lunch. And then when they get home at four o'clock, many mothers have said that's when they serve the main meal. 
and then they don't have to have much at night. Now I did mention my little grandchildren who they eat their meal, they have their bath, so they're actually going to bed within, uh, I don't know, an hour and a half of having, having their tea, but their tea is usually just a couple of pieces of fruit. So, you know, a couple of pieces of fruit, one can get away with that fairly close to bed, bedtime. So you see, it depends on many things. I was visiting a friend of mine and I was staying the night with her. I was traveling and I got there at six o'clock and she said, I didn't make any tea because I know you don't have an evening meal. And I said, actually, I haven't had any lunch and I'm starving. She said, what will I do? I said, just a plate of steamed vegetables. A plate of steamed vegetables will digest quite quickly. So I had that at 6.30 and then I went to bed. I think it was 9.30 and stomach was happy. But I didn't want, a lot of people say, I just have a light evening meal. I just have a couple of slices of bread. That's not light. That's heavy. <laughs> What's the lightest is fruits and vegetables. Some people choose to have soup at night if they, they feel they need something. So it all depends. If you've, see, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who grew up on a farm and he said, I'm one of six boys. He said, we'd have a hearty breakfast, we'd have a hearty lunch and we'd be out you know, with the cows and the fences all afternoon and we come home and there's a couple of pieces of fruit. <laughs> so we said we'd go to town and we'd just get takeaways. So what that mother should have done, she should have had something a little bit more substantial for her big muscly sons who've been working physically hard all afternoon. Um, you know, something a little bit more substantial. And what might that be? That might be... Um, that might be some steamed vegetables, it might be a hearty soup, yeah? Is it good to have um, protein at night? Is it good to have protein at night? Uh, usually it's not necessary, but again, it would depend on the person. If we have a very underweight person doing our program, we usually give them a little something at night. And as you'll see as we go on our journey through the gut, it, it depends on your uh, hydrochloric acid too. If you've got good... Uh, hydrochloric acid, you can, you know, you'll digest that quite quickly. But if the person has low hydrochloric acid, they're, they're better to have it a little bit lighter. So it, it depends. Those boys that have been out fencing and, you know, branding or whatever they do to cows, <laughs> and it's hard work, you know, they would do well with a soup that had some legumes in it, and which is protein. So a lot depends. What you're looking for, remember, is response. If you eat something at night and you go to bed and you can't sleep, well, don't eat that again. Try something else. But it is true the lightest things to eat at night would be a bowl of soup. Some people will make a smoothie. That's fairly light. And uh, in the morning you put protein in it, but in the evening you, there's no need. Or couple of pieces of fruit. So it, it depends, depends on many things. And that's what we do with our diabetics. We give them a smoothie at night. And if they say, oh, I couldn't sleep, that smoothie was so heavy, well, we won't do that again. We'll make, say, a lighter smoothie. And some people find just a glass of almond milk or a glass of soy milk, that, that will be enough. Yeah? Uh, and in one sense that sleep uh, before midnight is twice as much valuable than sleep That's right. Is that only due to the effect of the pineal gland or is there other factors involved in that as well? Are there other factors involved? Because um, the old saying, I'm sure we've all heard it, an hour before midnight is worth two after midnight. It basically mostly is the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. But in our next le lecture, we're going to have a look at the cycles that happen in the night and the different things that happen in the early part of the night compared to what happens in the late part of the night. So it is partly the pineal gland and is all, also partly what we're going to have a look in the next lecture. So what also increases the output of those hormones at night is nourishment, which means a plant-based diet that is generous in uh, proteins and fats and minerals and uh, vitamins. What can decrease is caffeine, 
With caffeine, it can cause a 50% uh, drop in the output of those hormones for five hours. Do you know what one lady said to me? Does that mean that I can have coffee in the morning then? <laughs> I said, no, for other reasons. And when we look at the temperance lecture, I'm, I'm going to show you exactly the effect that caffeine has. Alcohol. Alcohol, 40% reduction in the output of those hormones. Most people realize if they have coffee at night, they don't sleep well. Most people know that. The other is um, meat, especially at night. Meat at night inhibits because it is such a, such a work to break down the, the heaviness of the meat. So a lot of people that come to the retreat, you will find, are doing all of that. Mm -hmm. The beauty of presenting this in a lecture, and I often say to the people, this is the mirror. <laughs> and you'll see the light bulbs go off. Whereas if you say to them, you shouldn't be doing this at night, and you should be going to bed later at night, you know, it says if you stop pointing the finger. Yeah. So give them the information. And if someone says to me after seeing all that, nah, oh, that's not right. No, I, I like my coffee. I like my red wine at night. You know what I say over that? I just go, oh, <laughs> it's their choice. Yeah. And what's freedom based on? Choice. Free choice. Proverbs 16 verse, sorry, no, Proverbs 14 verse 6 says, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. What I find is that when people realise what's happening, then they can make a decision, actually, I don't, I don't want that anymore. And now I know why <coughs> I'm having trouble with it. So you can see, looking at all of this, we're basically <laughs> gone to the eight laws, haven't we? Fresh air, I think everyone knows that. Fresh air while you're sleeping, very important. So you've got that oxygen while you're sleeping. Exercise. We should, pardon? Exercise. Oh, I thought I'd put it there. Thank you. Absolutely. Should have been number one. <laughs> Exercise in the night. Sorry. No. <laughs> Exercise in the morning. Sometimes my brain jumps ahead. <laughs> Exercise in the morning means you'll sleep better at night. Mm. Yeah. So when I said exercise in the night, I'd missed out all the middle bits. Mm. <laughs> exercise in the day increases blood supply to the pineal gland so that it works more effectively at night. We're going to have a break. Oh, one more question, yeah? No, I will just uh, say to the exercise at the night, they said if you do heavy duty exercise in the evening, that stops us then from sleeping. If you exercise in the evening um, and you go to bed, often you, you're so awake. <laughs> But I, I mean, a light, work of an, a light walk of an evening can be great, especially if you have an evening meal. Um, that can be good, but not the strenuous. So um, even though the Ecclesiastes says, a sl the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, meaning when you physically exercise in the day, it, it brings exhaustion, physical exhaustion. And that's another reason why many people don't sleep, because they don't get physically exhausted.